We're going to begin in verse 15 and finish the chapter, Lord willing, tonight. Before we get into it, the story of Lot is intended by the Holy Spirit to make each and every one of us think before we make choices to compromise our witness, to rebel against God. We need to think about the consequences. We need to think about the impact before we make our choices. It's an important study. It's not a fun study. But this is one of those studies that as awful as it is, the love of God for you, for me, for our children just bleeds through this whole passage. Father, as we begin tonight, I ask that you pour your spirit out upon us. Truthfully, Lord, and you know this to be true, Paula has been reading this passage to me and every time she's done, I feel like we both need to take a shower. But you have an important message for all of us. So prepare our hearts to hear and respond. If there's anyone here tonight, anyone watching online, if they're not yet born again, or if perhaps they're making some bad choices without considering the cost of those choices, perhaps unaware that their own children are watching them as they make those bad choices, Lord, would you grip our hearts with the reality of the importance of our own personal testimonies, our own personal witness. I pray, Lord, that you would add to your family. And I thank you for the wonderful grace that you demonstrate even in a chapter that is filled with judgment. Open our hearts. We pray these things for your glory. Amen. God loves you so much. That's what I want you to keep saying to yourself throughout this whole thing. You know, when I taught this chapter last in 2009, that's 11 years ago, it wasn't nearly as urgent. It was still just as creepy, just as awful as, as it is now. But things have changed so much in just the last 11 years that there's a sense of urgency over and over and over these days. We who are pastors here at Calvary Chapel have adults, parents coming to us and asking us, what am I to do about my son or my daughter? They think they're gay. And I don't know what to do and I want to love them and I don't want to upset them, but, but what do we do? And we tell them, don't compromise your witness. And we tell them that because compromise costs so very, very much. Now, 11 years ago when I taught this, this was all sort of theory, but now we're all living in this time where before our very eyes we can see the world around us sort of imploding. And it's happened with such breakneck speed that it leaves us a little spiritually dizzy. How could this have happened? How did it sneak up on us? And how did things change so quickly? Well, the story of Lot and his wife and his daughters, I hope will bring a serious edge to what we're studying tonight. One other thought I want you to keep in the forefront of your mind. You've heard me say many, many times that you aren't responsible for the choices your children make. But if they make bad choices, we all of us as parents need to be able to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, it wasn't my fault that they made those choices. We raised them to know you. We raised them to love you. Our walk with you was consistent. If you could say that, then there's no blood, figuratively speaking, on your hands. I pray that everyone here who is a parent would reevaluate what other people in your homes know about you. Verse 15 says, With the coming of dawn, the angels, remember these are the two destroying angels, they're supervised here by Jesus himself. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, 
Take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. Highlight these next three words. When he hesitated. Now, can you imagine that he would hesitate at all? I think that's the saddest line in this whole study tonight. It's rivaled by the last verse in our study last time. Lot's son-in-laws thought he was, their sons-in-law thought he was joking when he tried to tell them about judgment that was coming. I'm not going to get into a whole judgment is coming thing again, but, but a lot of us take too lightly the return of Jesus for his church that could happen literally at any moment. We take too lightly the people that we love, people that we are praying for. They're going to be in the middle of the judgment. Tonight we have such a horrible picture of this judgment. It's hard to imagine that Lot hesitated. Now I want you to consider what Lot has seen. Lot was rescued by God a few chapters back when God sent Abraham, his uncle, against the five kings in a war Because Lot and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah had been taken away. And they were going to be killed. They would have kept uh, the, the women and the children and they would have enslaved them. But Abraham took an army of 318 men. And he had this incredible, really, victory over them. And you would think from that moment on, Lot and everybody else in Sodom and Gomorrah would be so grateful to God. You saved us. You rescued us. But, but they're not grateful at all. The people in Sodom, as soon as the angels came, they, they went after Lot saying, no, bring those men out so that we can have sex with them. And these were all of the men, you remember, young and old. So this isn't just a few bad apples. This is everyone. He hesitated. God now sends angels to him to spare him. And he hesitates. I think a lot of us as believers hesitate to put away things of the flesh. Lot had a home in Sodom. Sodom, the best estimates that we have of its population, was that it was at least a million people And it was a thriving ancient world metropolis. He had a home, he had friends, he had position, he had uh, things that were important to him. And he didn't want to let go of them, so he hesitated. Can you imagine an angel saying, come on, you've got to hurry? And Lot saying, well, you know, not so fast. Well, I think that's what we're guilty of at times when we read the Bible and it says flee from sexual immorality or flee from the evil desires of youth from our study last Sunday. And we think, well, wait, wait a minute, I'm not quite ready to give up that relationship. I'm not quite ready to give up the booze. I'm not quite ready to give up the drugs. You know, these things, I, I'm still wrestling with them. And we who have so much to be grateful to God for, we likewise hesitate. And God is saying, no, no, get out of here. Get out of here. Lot hesitated. Now, by this time, Lot had become so spiritually dulled by Sodom that for him, trusting God was a novelty. It was only theory. Abraham trusted God when he took that small army and, and defeated a far superior army of the five armies of the five kings. Abraham didn't hesitate. Abraham was still in touch with God but not so with Lot. Now remember, we're going to read this chapter tonight. We're going to think, was was Lot even saved? How could he possibly be saved? But we know he was because Peter refers to him in the New Testament as a righteous man vexed in his spirit by all the filth around him. But make no mistake, when you're around filth, your spirit is going to be dulled. And that's exactly what happens here. And trusting God is something that was now foreign to him. I tell you all the time that faith needs to be exercised. And unless we exercise our faith, it won't be there available for us when we need it. Well, because he hesitated, it says the men, these are the two angels, grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters, and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. And that just means the Lord had pity. 
Now, if, if this was us, we'd say, if Jesus was anything like us, we'd say, well, 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 he was frustrated with them. He was impatient with them. No, God had pity on them. He understands the effects of sin. Even while Lot was hesitating, God's servants, the destroying angels, took matters into their own hands. It says they seized, if you have a new American standard, or they laid hold of Lot and his family in the King James. In the Septuagint, it's the Greek version of the Old Testament, one of our best translations, says they snatched him away. That Greek word is harpazod. And it means they suddenly took him from one place to another, sort of miraculously. The Lord was merciful and snatched them away from impending judgment. Now, I want you to look ahead just briefly. We're going to get there again in a moment. But look at verse 22 very briefly. Because the angels told him, I cannot do anything. In other words, we've got to get you out of here before we can begin this judgment. I cannot do anything until you're gone. This is an important picture for us. It shows us a lot about God's character, something Abraham understood because Abraham asked Jesus, would you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? If there are 50 people in, in Sodom, would you spare the city? And we remember he negotiated all the way down to five. There wasn't five righteous people. So before God could pour out his wrath on Sodom, Lot had to be removed. In the same way, that's why we cannot be here during the Great Tribulation when God is pouring out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. When Jesus comes and harpazoed us away, when he snatches us away, we're going to be caught up to be with him in the air. We're not appointed, Paul's letter to the Thessalonians says, unto wrath, but unto salvation. And the reason that we can't be here is because God's wrath is the only thing the Great Tribulation is about. So we've got to be gone. First Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17 says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left, this is a pre-trib rapture promise, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Because of God's mercy, because our sins have already been paid for with the wrath of God, placed upon Jesus instead of on us, it's impossible that we can be here during the great tribulation. Verse 29 will say that God remembered Abraham, faithful Abraham, and that's why he sent the angels, and that's why he snatched Lot out of the way. Our God is just. When he judges the world, you and I will be nowhere near the scene of judgment. Verse 17 says, As soon as they had brought them out, finally, the angels would say, one of them said, Flee for your lives. Don't look back. And don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, lords, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes. Lot is acknowledging that, that he is the object of God's favor here. And you've shown great kindness to me in sparing my life, but I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me and I will die. Look, here's a town near enough to run to, and it's small. Let me flee to it. It's very small, isn't it? then my life will be spared. Here's another thing that needs to be exercised in addition to your faith, and that's your courage. Lot's been away from the Lord in fellowship for so long that he no longer trusts that God's going to protect him. I would just say, if I was the angel, I would have said, uh, Abraham was sent against the five kings. It's the only reason you're alive. Trust him. You can make it. And his faith is failing. His courage is failing. And instead of just doing what the angels tell him to do, he's already beginning to compromise. We're going to find that that doesn't work out very well. Now, I understand fear. I've told you over and over that I am in fear every day of my life as your pastor. 
but I can never let fear keep me from being obedient to the Lord. I can never let fear stop me from taking that step of faith and seeing what God is going to do. I've learned a long time ago not to argue with the Lord when he says, do something this way. Well, well, Lord, it makes a lot more sense to come to the, the closer place, to take the easy way out. But Lot hasn't learned that lesson. We live in a time when there is a lot in this world to be afraid of. If we could send an anonymous poll to all of you and that question was, are you afraid right now? If it was completely anonymous, I think every one of you would say yes. It's because we're smart. We know there are things to be fearful of. But we also know that God will protect us. He'll cover us. He goes before us. He covers our rear guard. Numbers says that that his everlasting hands are beneath us lest we fall. Lot simply has forgotten that God could be trusted. Lot wasn't doing well in his walk with God. But we know that his wife, in particular because of, her com- because of his compromised witness, well, her heart was still in Sodom. She didn't want to go. Now, these angels were on a mercy mission, and Lot told them no. And that would indicate that Lot's heart was not truly repentant. Yeah, he was sorry there was going to be judgment, but he was sorry because he was going to lose people. He was sorry because his family was on board. He was sorry because his sons-in-law thought he was joking with them. He understood that moment how compromised his witness was. You know, those of us who are fathers, we want our children to respect us. We want them to see consistency. And Lot is coming face to face right now with the fact that his witness has been so compromised that not even those in his own family are listening to him. If he was truly repentant, Lot would accept the consequences. You tell me to go out of the city, I'm going to go out of the city, no questions asked. When we are truly repentant for the things that we've done, We accept the consequences. We confess to the people that we've sinned against. If your children have watched you go up and down, hot and cold in your walk with the Lord, you need to sit down with them and say, please forgive me, let's start over. I don't care if your children are brand new or they're in high school or in college. It's a time to say, your dad, for you ladies, your mom, hasn't been faithful. We haven't been consistent. And that's on me. And if you can do that, you will earn their respect back. God will open their hearts. But you've got to accept responsibility. The other thing that Lot wasn't willing to do, as we just indicated, was that he wasn't willing to follow God's instructions. Another indication that Lot wasn't truly repentant. And of course, because you've read ahead, you know that the result is going to be tons and tons of trouble. Verse 21, the angel said to him, Very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of. He can now go to Zoar. Zoar means small, by the way. But flee there quickly. Here's the key again, because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That is why the town was called Zoar. Now, there are some bad teachings out there about God's will. You know, people say, well, you know, I know I'm not in God's perfect will, but I'm in God's permissive will. I wonder if Lot would have tried that with the angels. God wants me out of here. He wants me to flee to the mountains. But he said, no, no, let me go to this small place. It's closer. It's going to be easier to get there. And by the way, don't forget for a moment that it means he would be close enough to go back to Sodom if there was anything to rebuild. And he could have said, I'm in God's permissive will. God, let me do it. There's only one will of God, and I want all of you to be in it every day of your life, and that's God's perfect, pleasing, and acceptable will. This whole idea of, well, you know, there's his perfect will and his permissive will. As long as I'm in his permissive will, God will still bless. You don't understand who he is any more than Lot understood who he was. It says, by the time Lot reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land, 
Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. That's the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty. And the repetition there is important. He wants us to understand this is judgment from God. We've all heard those questions. Well, you know, the Old Testament God is so mean and so unloving and so harsh and Jesus is so much love. Jesus loves everybody. He gives grace to everybody. Why is the Old Testament God different than the New Testament God? They're not different at all. I refer you to Revelation chapter 19 when Jesus comes back and destroys all of his enemies with a word. That's a New Testament. He rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord's out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. Everything was ruined. Now this is in the region of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea's salt content is such that you can actually float on top of the water. Nothing can grow. There's no water in. There's no water out. Nothing whatsoever can grow. And archaeologists, I mentioned this to you last week, archaeologists have discovered what they believe to be some of the remains of Sodom and Gomorrah underneath the Dead Sea. God just destroyed everything. This is such an important picture because God wants us to understand the gravity of judgment. You know, we know judgment is real. We know instinctively. We know because we've got Bibles that we believe in, but we live our lives so often like God's not going to judge us. Oh, I can backslide a little bit. God's not going to judge me. He understands. He loves me. He'll be patient with me. We don't understand judgment. We're afraid to tell our children who come to us and say, well, I'm gay or I'm transgender. We're afraid to tell them that's wrong because we don't understand judgment. I told you last week that if you approve of your son's homosexual lifestyle, active homosexual lifestyle, you're approving of a lifespan of just over 43 years. Why don't we understand that judgment is real and it's severe and it's harsh? He destroyed everything. There was nothing left. Verse 26, But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Anybody here know Lot's wife's name? She doesn't have one. I mean, she did, but now it's completely lost forever. There is no memory of who she was or an impact she might have had in the world. Because she was judged, the memory's gone. You know, I get asked the question on the radio from time to time about, well, well, how can heaven be nice if our loved ones aren't there? Well, the answer is there will be no memory of our loved ones when we get there. That's why we need to work so hard now and be so faithful and be so concerned about the, the, the value of our own witness to them to take every spare minute that we're given to try to win them to Christ. We become so forgiving. We become so accepting of sin. Our family members will look at us and say, look, I just don't want to hear about it. And we sort of back off instead of saying, wait, I don't care. If you want me here, you're going to hear about it because I can't imagine heaven without you. Why can't we be bold? It's because maybe we don't think judgment is real. Lot's wife, no memory of her left on the earth. She looked back and was turned into a pillar of salt. Now, 
In the area around the Dead Sea, there are many salt pillars. It's just part of what the wind does over a period of time, even to this day. They're large mounds. You can go online and look at them. And Arabs call them Lot's wife. That's their name for those mounds, indicating that everybody knows this story. Everybody knows it's true. Oh, yeah, there's Lot's wife. In fact, Josephus, a Jewish historian working for Rome in the time of Jesus and afterward, said that in his day that Lot's wife could still be seen through the pillar of salt. So everybody knows the story's true. I want all of us to know it's true before the loved ones in our lives are forced to be judged by God. We who are New Testament Christians should need no other warning than this one from Jesus himself. In Luke chapter 17, he says to his disciples and to those who are listening to his message, he says, you know, in the end it will be like it was in the days of Lot's wife. Life just goes on. Every day is like the day before. But then he exhorted the people listening, and especially his disciples. He said, remember Lot's wife. In Greek, that's in the continuous present tense. So it means keep on remembering Lot's wife. I want all of you to keep on remembering Lot's wife continually. Because she represents the future, the people that we love, the people that we care about. So he tells the disciples, just sort of throws it out there, remember Lot's wife. And then he says this, whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. Lot's wife looked back, and it's a verb, she looked back longingly. Lot hesitated but left, but she turned back wanting to go back. Remember when God's people, Israel, were set free from slavery in Egypt. As soon as they came out, I mean, the, 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 the exodus was glorious. Everybody was rejoicing, praising God, grateful to God for all he'd done. But then they ran out of water. They ran out of food. And they would look at Moses and say, why have you brought us out here? At least in Egypt, we had leeks and onions and we had food to eat. Now we have no food to eat and we have no water to drink. I mean, our gratitude just doesn't last very long, does it? And in this particular case, Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Her her heart was still in Sodom. She didn't care for the things of God. And Lot lost his wife. He's now going to live a life without the woman he loves. His daughters are going to be without their mother. And that's why we remember Lot's wife. She didn't hate the sin in Sodom. She'd grown comfortable with it. For any of you who are believers... And unfortunately, there are many, and I hope not here at Calvary Chapel, but, but, but that would be naive of me to think that's not the case. For those of you who have grown accepting of homosexual relationships or this whole morass of transgenderism, you've sent your children to public school where they're taught that these things are normal all the while being taught that anybody who disagrees with them, including their parents, are bigots and not fit for the world in the 21st century. What we do matters. The choices we make matter. The power, the effectiveness of our witness matters. And if you're one of those people who thinks, yeah, what's the big deal? They love each other. It doesn't have anything to do with me. You've lost the heart of God. 
You've lost the heart of God. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he'd stood before the Lord. You know, that's a benign verse, or at least it appears so. But notice the difference. Lot hesitated when the angels tried to spare him. Lot had been so uh, Sodom-oriented that he grew accustomed to the sin. Not Abraham. Abraham got up and returned to the place of prayer, the place where he communed with God. Abraham's life, I told you at the beginning of our study in Abraham, was characterized by altars. Everywhere he went, he built an altar. So now he goes out and returned to that place where he'd stood before the Lord, where he was negotiating with him. This was now a new altar in his life. And he went out there and he wanted to survey what had happened. And he entered the presence of the Lord while Lot was fleeing to Zoar. It says he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. Three short verses, and God takes a break for an oasis in the wilderness, an oasis named Abraham. He sets before us the contrast, the one who loves God, the one who spends time with God, the one who is grateful to God, in contrast to a relative who almost got caught up in the judgment and lost his family in the process. I told you that we read this story and we think, well, well, how could Lot even be saved? Well, we know he was, but he was saved, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, as one escaping through the fire. In other words, there's no fruit in his life. No one could tell he was a believer. And he was saved because of the mercy of God. Verse 30 is where the real ugliness begins. Lot and his two daughters left Zoar, and settled in the mountains. Now remember, the angels wanted to take him to the mountains earlier. They could have been there the easy way with the angels grabbing them and taking them in their power. But he and his two daughters left Zoar, settled in the mountains, for he was afraid to stay in Zoar. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. Now in this part of the world, caves are plentiful. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in a cave just like the one that's being described here. Lot's wasting more time. I wonder how many times he'd look at his daughters in that cave and say, I'm the reason we're here. I wonder if he would look at his daughters, and I don't have much hope for this, but at least I can hope a little bit. I I would hope that that when he was staying in these caves, he would say to his daughters, your dad messed up. Don't do what I did. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind. You know, my dad used to tell me over and over, Ronnie, do as I say, not as I do. But you know what? My dad should have repented of that. He should have asked me for forgiveness of that. Moms, dads, you need to walk with Jesus uprightly before the Lord, so that your children can see, so that you can have joy, so that you can have hope, so they can see the hand of God move in and through your lives. Again, I don't have much hope that Lot ever sat down with his two daughters in this cave and said, I- I'm sorry, I should have been a better dad, I should have been a better example of following God. Can you please forgive me and maybe together we can start over? The reason I don't think that happened is because of what happens next. One day the older daughter, now the older daughter typically should have been an example to the younger daughter, not so in this case. One day the older daughter said to the younger, Our father is old and there's no man around here to lie with us as is the custom all over the earth. You might highlight that as well. As is the custom 
over all the earth. When in Rome, do what the Romans do. When in the United States, do what Americans do. Remember, we Christians are supposed to be set apart. We're not supposed to follow the customs of this world. We're not even to be aware of them. I mean, we're, not, we're, we're intellectually aware, of course, but, but, but those aren't to be things that tempt us. Instead, we should stand out from the world. The church, the Greek word is ekklesia. And it means the separated ones. And too often, churches don't look separated at all. We can go into churches and teach you that God wants you to be rich and, and he wants you to be healthy. All you have to do is believe it enough and give your money and, and God will fix all these things. Well, that's just carnal. That's just appealing to our lusts. Sometimes we'll go to churches and we'll see there's thousands and thousands of people and it looks like they're putting on a concert instead of worshiping God at a church service. You'll see laser lights and smoke effects and They'll turn down the lights and try to get you swaying back and forth. And, and they do that because that's what happens in the world. That's what moves people in the world. Well, that's just the custom of the world that we live in. Let me get a little bit more serious, I hope. A little closer to home. How many children that were raised in Christian homes are living in a sinful relationship with their boyfriend or their girlfriend because well that's just the custom of the world I mean we love each other we're committed God understands and parents will still receive them into their homes like it's okay it's, but it's not with the issue of homosexuality any one of us who stands against this sin who stands with and for Jesus is going to be criticized by anyone and everyone, even people in your own family. But we're not supposed to go along with the custom of the world. And now we've got the older daughter explain to the younger daughter that, you know, our husbands to be, well, they're gone. And we're not going to have a family. Evidently, Lot never taught them that they could trust God, that God was good, that God would provide. I mean, that's the custom all over the earth. Every one of us ought to examine everything that is normal in this world, sort of going with the flow of the world. But is it godly or is it ungodly? And we need to make our choices appropriately. These girls, presumably still virgins, though we don't know that for sure, were at least not virgins of the heart. We're not going to have kids. We're going to be on our own. So we got to take matters into our own hands. And this verse clearly indicates they had no shame or conscious conscience at all regarding sexually immoral behavior. And you might want to write this down. They learned it from dad. They learned it from mom. When I said at the beginning of this Bible study, if your kids make the wrong choices, make sure it's not your fault. That's exactly what I mean. If you love your children, and I know you do, then be a good witness. Be a good example. Be a, a, a father or a mother that can say to your kids, follow me as I follow Christ. Get the family together and teach them the word of God. Pray together. Sit around the table together and talk about the things that you're grateful for so that your children understand that mom and dad's Jesus is good and he loves me. And he's a source of great joy for them. But if what your kids see is you going along with the flow of this world, then all they're going to see is hypocrisy and the things that you claim to believe in. Lot's behavior made their choice to sin an easy choice. 
I know we think we don't owe explanation to our kids. We think there's a lot of stuff they don't know. We can hide from them. But here's what you really need to know. Your children know your secrets. Your children know your secrets. They know if you're drinking at home. They know if you're doing drugs. They know if you're watching stuff you're not supposed to watch. They know if mom and dad are yelling at each other, calling each other horrible names. Your kids know your secrets. And why would they want your Jesus if they're living in that environment? What difference would your Jesus make to them? Don't make your children's choices to sin easy. Here's what she says in verse 32. Let's get our father to drink wine and then lie with him and preserve our family line through our father. You want another example of bad example setting? How many times have they seen Lot passed out drunk in their home? They knew exactly how he would respond if they offered him some wine. They knew what the result would be. They knew that he would pass out completely dead to the world. He'd done it so many times that they were able to predict his behavior and they were to able to hatch this horrible, horrible plot. This is the second time that drunkenness has come up in Scripture. First time with Noah. And he lie uncovered in his tent. And Ham made fun of him. Well, the other two sons at least walked in backwards to cover their father's nakedness. This is the second time, and this is markedly worse than the first time. They knew that he was going to be passed out drunk. Now, I haven't been around a whole bunch of drunk people because I've never drank anything myself. But I remember... In my high school days, I was always a designated driver. I remember what it was like to be around. It was absolutely disgusting. And this kind of shame was so regular in their home that they knew that this is what would happen. So that night, they got their father to drink wine, and the older daughter went in and lay with him. He was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. The next day, the older daughter said to the younger, last night I lay with my father. She's proud of it. Mission accomplished. So let's get him to drink wine again tonight. And you go in and lie with him so we can preserve our family line through our father. So they got their father to drink wine that he might also, or that night also. And the younger daughter went and lay with him. Again, he was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. Now, one of the things that I want to clear up here, Lot gets a lot of criticism for raping his daughters. He didn't rape his daughters. He himself was raped. This is the fruit of the poisonous tree. Lot set a bad example. His witness was so unsteady and inconsistent as was his wife's witness. And so he was a drunken, unwitting victim in these things. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son, and she named him Moab. He's the father of the Moabites today. The younger daughter also had a son, and she named him Ben-Ami. He's the father of the Ammonites of today. The Ammonites, Amon, Jordan. This is the area around Jordan. Now, both of these people, as we know from studying our Bibles, were confirmed enemies of God and God's people. Sin never produces good fruit. Not ever. And yet, that's what we see here. This chapter ends with consequences beyond anything that we can imagine. We can't comprehend the, the, the ugliness of this story. Except most of us have experienced really severe consequences from some of the really ugly things that we've done. And we need to be aware of our responsibility to walk with him, to walk for him. Remember to be grateful. Lot and his family wouldn't even be alive now if God hadn't sent Abraham to rescue him. 
the people living in the city of Sod- cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, they didn't have to be dead now. All they had to remember is God was so gracious that he sent Abraham to rescue us and we're alive because he gave us life. And all they had to do was say, thank you, God. If you can rescue me from that, I'm going to follow you. But no one was interested in that. The choices that we make in life matter. It's unthinkable. And yet we've got these two daughters who because of a compromised witness of their mother and their father think nothing of hatching a plot like this. Now the real tragedy of this is something I mentioned last week a couple of times. That Lot, a righteous man, was vexed in his spirit because of all the ungodliness, because of all the wickedness around him. What that means is that as Lot made choices to compromise, as Lot grew relatively comfortable in Sodom, he was miserable the whole time. Have you ever thought there was somebody that you couldn't live without? You just couldn't live without them. And so, I know I shouldn't do this, but... And then you make the decision, and you're miserable the whole time. We cross the line of sexual morality and immorality. And we think, wow, that's going to be great. And and it is for a minute, but, but then you're miserable the whole time. It's because you're a child of God and... The Holy Spirit lives in us. And we've got to be able to accept the consequences of these decisions. We've got to be men and women who learn to repent of our sins or we're going to be miserable. James calls people like this double-minded, unstable men and women in all of their ways. If you, as a believer, have been won over to the the world's way of thinking... then you're miserable. I know it. And you know it. You can pretend, but you know that you're pretending. Because God won't give you a moment's peace because he cares so much about you that he wants to use you. And in order to be able to use you, you have to be usable. By that I mean you've got to be walking with Jesus. You've got to be walking for him. And one more time, I want to remind you that 11 years ago when I taught this Bible study, nobody who heard it, including me, would ever have dreamed that we would be as a nation where we are today. It was just impossible. If as a preacher I would have warned against it, people said, oh, he's just trying to scare us. But look where we are. And for the sake of your walk with Jesus, for the sake of the joy of the Lord, for the sake of your children, we have to make a decision about who we really are. Lot thought he could have it both ways. I can have Sodom with its wealth, with its influence with position, and I can still have God. After all, didn't God just rescue me from the five kings? Problem is, he was wrong. If you think that you can have it both ways, like Lot, you are also wrong. Let me close very quickly with this. If you began a relationship in sexual immorality, repent. If you've already done it, God bless you, but if not, repent. Paula and I began our relationship in sexual immorality 50 years ago. We didn't know God, and we could look and say, well, you know, it turned out all right. There has been a lot of pain as a result of that sin. A lot of pain. And as a father, I've had to sit before my boys 
and explain to them that the things I did, the shameful things I did were wrong. Sin against God and sin against them. They saw a father who treated their mother horribly. And I had to talk to them about that. The word is repent. Turn back to the Lord and walk with him and for him. And watch the joy of the Lord come flooding back. If you've been involved in ungodly behavior, sit down with your kids and tell them. Details aren't necessary. Sit down and tell them. Ask them for forgiveness. That's what it means to be a man. That's what it means to be a woman of God. Not just to pass over it, but to sit before your kids and own your sin and let them know that they can watch mom and dad from this point forward because we're going to do it better. We're going to do it differently. We're going to do it with Jesus. Jesus.